five, four, three, hands on keys, turn. Greetings and felicitations. This is episode zero of season one of Quantum Froth Dispatches, QFD for short. And uh, what is this about? Well, it is a podcast about storytelling, despite the uh, title making you think that it might be a podcast about um, science. It We will talk about science, but kind of peripherally. This is more or less um, a podcast about storytelling and all the different media, pop culture, uh, games, history, conspiracy theories, um, what captivates people about different stories? Why are people drawn to, say, conspiracies about the Anunnaki or Roswell, 1947, or even something as mundane, seemingly, as the Denver International Airport, where something is just, you know, where there might be lizard people leaving, living underneath or FEMA camps or some kind of Masonic conspiracy. For some reason, people really love the Masons. Masons and Templars seem to draw a lot of uh, conspiracies. And why is that? Well, because they, they have good stories. But that's not all we're going to talk about on Quantum Froth Dispatches. We're going to talk about craft, on what makes a good story, how to craft a good story. Because uh, ultimately, I'm an author, and I would like to help other people who are trying to be authors or who, who are authors themselves with some storytelling techniques, some little tips and tricks that uh, you can use to get to the crux of your story, uh, make, you know, cut through a lot of the chaff and uh, really get to the punchy thing. And right now, especially in today's publishing environment, that is really, really important. There is no patience for uh, dilly-dallying around. In fact, a lot of editors don't care for prologues in fantasy anymore, where that used to be a staple of the genre. You used to have to have a um, a prologue and a map in the front of the book, or people wouldn't read it. You know, so uh, but now things have changed, and you need to grab people like immediately, or you're not going to get picked up. Uh, we're also going to have author interviews on here. I happen to be really lucky in the fact that I have a lot of contacts among the writing community. So we're going to get, uh, hopefully, a lot of author interviews. And then we're going to have a couple surprises, too. We might be talking about gaming or headcanon. You know, um, you know what, would, what, what would happen if there's like an alternate uh, ending to Battlestar Galactica, the series, since a lot of uh, people were felt or were left, um, you know, disenchanted by by the ending of the uh, the new series. Well, we might talk about that. We're going we're going to be all over the place. Is basically what I want to get across. It but the the thing that links everything together is stories. Storytelling and how the human being itself is wired for story. We take things and we make stories out of out of things that might not even be there. If I if I show people uh, a couple of disjointed photographs I can get almost everyone to make a story out of it. And and that's just the way we're hardwired. Uh, if you look at the way our news works, whether you appreciate it or not, whether you believe that it's a positive thing or not, um, people take, you know, a one minute soundbite and convert it into a story. They, they change it, they morph it, and then they run and comment on it for hours just to fill airspace. Now, why might I call this quantum froth dispatches? Well, okay, so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive here. So what is the quantum froth, right? So the quantum froth is when you, it's a theory, first of all. No one's really actually observed this directly, but mathematically they've been able to show this. When you get deep, deep down, down to the quantum level, or some might say the quantum realm, don't sue me, Marvel, <laughs> um, you get down to uh, the gluon and muon level 
reality is not flat. It's not a smooth surface. It's constantly bubbling. There's, there's particles of reality that are instantly coming into existence, existing for some unspecified moment of time and then disappearing again. And they're, they're quantized in the sense that it's not a binary thing. It's not like a, a one and a zero. There's every possibility in between zero and one. Is, is being created and disappearing simultaneously. And it ties in with the whole many worlds theories. And uh, again, to, to kind of dodge Marvel and Disney, uh, I think it's going to play a huge role in Avengers 4 based on post credit sequence of Ant- Ant-Man. That's, that's what they're kind of dancing around. That There's like many worlds and quantum realms and stuff. And in the book timeline, I think that's the way they were able to go back in time and stuff like that. So I was always fascinated by that idea that the resolution of the universe, once you got down to that thing, it's kind of cheating a little bit. It's not, it, it's, um, it's kind of loading, loading shaders and textures as it goes, kind of like a video game, you know? So, uh, and, and in fact, some people think that the existence of quantum foam is proof that we're living in a simulation because it doesn't need to render it smoothly. Uh, it can render it, but of course we're talking at the electron proton, you know, what, what constitutes those levels, what makes, what makes protons and electrons. And I think they're called gluons and muons. I'm not a physicist or a math scientist or math magician or any of the other things that Kenny would identify himself as. Um, so that's generally referred to as the quantum foam. Uh, why quantum froth? Because my stuff's a little bit more like a hipster cappuccino, you know, that you can put art in and uh, make stuff. Or maybe it's like the foam at the top of a fine craft beer after you've like been working all day, you've achieved a goal, and now you're sitting around in good company. That's kind of what I want the quantum froth it to be. And um, the quantum froth dispatches are kind of like messages from the quantum froth, you know? Um, but I wanted it to be a little bit weirder because I'm, I'm like that. So I couldn't just say like messages from the quantum froth. It had to be dispatches, you know? And, uh, it had kind of a, a covert air about it. Like, Oh, I'm getting, you know, dispatches and you'll see all throughout some stuff. You'll see references to, uh, Umbra. And that is a, uh, in my stories, that is a, kind of a government secret organization that deals with uh, supernatural stuff. Not necessarily just vampires and werewolves, although they do with that uh, also, and mummies, because my main character is a, is a mummy. But uh, they deal with all kinds of just weird stuff. And, and we'll, we'll talk about those stories to do too. Okay, so what I wanted to cover with season one of QFD is um, what, what was in the water? in 1982. And I'm not the first person to discover this. Uh, I think the Alamo Draft House ran a whole series of, of movies based on uh, what was going on in 1982. But uh, I, I have a feeling that when people talk about the 80s, a lot of what they're talking about is 1982. And it's, it's really odd. Like, um, a bunch of really great classics came out in 1982. Um, you had The Eye of the Tiger came out in 1982. Toto's Africa came out in 92, or 82. The uh, Commodore 64 launched in 82. Donkey Kong Jr., Zaxxon, you know, those, those launched in 82. Uh, Miss Pac-Man, which is, some people might argue, more popular than Pac-Man. I, I like it better than Pac-Man. That came out in 1982. But uh, since, you know, we're going to talk about storytelling, um, we're going to talk about movies, right? And I'm going to just really quickly go down a laundry list of some of the movies that came out in 1982. And they are, uh, they are some classics here. Now, there are some that I call unsung heroes because they're movies that mean a lot to me, but they might not be very good. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, so here are some movies that came out in 1982. Conan, the barbarian, star Trek two, the wrath of Khan, ET, the dark crystal, blade runner, uh, first blood, 
Rocky III, The Thing, Poltergeist, Tron, 48 Hours, Annie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Gandhi, Koyaniskatsi, to those of you who would like go to the theater super late and, uh, and watch it after Heavy Metal or the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Although I don't think Heavy Metal was out yet. <laughs> um, the Last Unicorn, Megaforce, uh, An Officer and a Gentleman, um, Porky's, Tootsie, Victor, Victoria. And then these are some of the unsung heroes, the ones that I really like. They've become kind of cult classics. Cat People, Beastmaster, The Sword and the Sorcerer, Firefox, The Secret of Nim, Airplane 2, Creepshow, and The Swamp Thing. All those came out in 1982. So, um... Initially, that's what we're going to explore. We're going to explore what was going on, like why, why all these movies came out in 1982 and why were they really good for the most part, you know? Um, and these are, they're great movies. I, I, I watch a lot of these. I haven't, I, I confess, I haven't seen The Secret of Nim in a long, long time. And The Sword and the Sorcerer certainly doesn't hold up. But Cat People had a profound influence on me. And not on me alone. And this was a movie that, you know, it was a remake um, from a movie that, was, that came out in the 30s, if I'm, if I'm recalling correctly. And uh, they had kind of turned it into this soft core, kind of very sexual film. So I'm not that old. So honestly, I don't know how I, how I saw this. But <laughs> Panthers, like Black Panthers, were a thing all of a sudden. And it it eked into pop culture. A couple of years after Cat People came out, we got Manimal. And the primary animal that he would change into, as campy as Manimal is for an 80s show, was a Black Panther. That's what he would turn into. And, I, and it's directly linked to Cat People. And in my own novel, I made sure to pay some serious uh, tributes to Cat People in there. Um, but there's a ton of stuff. Well, the first, first film we're going to talk about uh, will be in the next episode, and it's going to be Conan the Barbarian, directed by uh, John Milius and starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some might say that it made Schwarzenegger's career. Uh, it certainly put him on the map. He had made a couple of movies beforehand, but after Conan the Barbarian, he was a force to be reckoned with. And uh, that is what we're going to talk about next time. So thank you for listening in, and uh, keep it clean and green. And this is Mike Haspel. Out. You have been listening to Quantum Froth Dispatches by Michael Haspel. Music and other cues are provided by The Fat Rat. The song you're hearing is Monody, featuring Laura Brem. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash QFD. Thank you for listening, and we now return you to your mundane reality.